Mayor Eric Adams. You don't realize it, but you just assaulted me with that <laughs> handshake. I'll try and be a little more gentle next please, time. Please, I'll please. I'll try and be a little more gentle. You know, Welcome please. to the show. Thank you, because, you know, you doing that, you could be inside for 24 hours, you know? You Let, know. Let's talk about that before we move on. Like, I, I heard what you said about Rudy Giuliani. You said that he should actually be investigated for reporting a false crime, because if it wasn't for that video footage, that person who tapped him on the back, which, again, I don't condone, but that wasn't assault. No, it was not. And, and you know, we, we're, we are joking about it, but think about this for a moment. There was a woman called, we called her Karen, uh, Brother told her to put a dog on her leash. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I t t said to the DA, listen, that's a false... She falsely reported a crime. She needs to be arrested. He falsely reported a crime. And the district attorney should take that seriously. That person that he falsely reported spent 24 hours in jail. That's not acceptable. Hmm. It's not acceptable. And so I'm going to call the DA. We must be consistent. All of that theatrics that he did... That's not acceptable. If that tape wasn't there, imagine what would, would have happened to that man. Yeah. Yeah. Can't happen. Can't happen. Well, uh, uh, you're the uh, mayor. You can make those calls. And you know what's interesting? What's interesting is that when you saw the testimony in Washington, uh -huh. he has some other things he has to deal with as well. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely saw that. But let's, let's talk about you, man. Let's yes, talk, we don't want to yes. give it all to him. Um, yes. You, you, you have now been in office for, is it six months now, officially? Hard to believe. You know, when you're the mayor of New York, it's like a dog day. Every day is 14. <laughs> it, it is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Uh, it's also one of the most thankless jobs in the world. You've had your ups, you've had your downs. Let's talk about some of the things people have commended you on. Mm -hmm. Many New Yorkers have really been impressed by your, the attitude you've taken uh, to education. You know, you've come in, you've revamped the system. You, 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 you're creating a world where, you know, your, your, your staff is really focusing on getting New York City's education up to where it needs to be. Two parts to the question. Number one, what do you still think needs to be achieved in terms of education in New York? And number two, how do you, how do you remove or fight against all of the segregation that happens in New York City schools? Because you have a city where everyone mixes, and yet in the schools, it seems like the city is still in Jim Crow. You know, you know a couple of things. Number one, uh, I learned a lot when I was in South Africa. I drove from Cape Town to... Port Elizabeth to Joburg, mm -hmm. and I spoke to a lot of people there. When people talk about segregation, they don't look at the hidden segregation we have in America. Right. Our school system is dysfunctional, and we have acknowledged that dysfunctionality because black and brown and poorer students are the impact of that. 65% of black and brown children never reach proficiency in uh, our New York City school system. Wow. And we've normalized that. And so what I did, I looked at my journey. I was dyslexic. I'm dyslexic. From uh, K through 12, I used to walk in the school building. They used to put dumb suited on the chair. I was bullied. And then not until I got into high school did I discover I was dyslexic. There was nothing wrong with me. Wow. 30 to 40% of the prisoners that are in Rikers Island, dyslexic. So what am I doing as mayor? I'm taking my journey and now helping other children. We have dyslexia screening for every child now, and I'm going to Rikers and screen the prisoners for dyslexia so they can get the services they need. You've also, um... You've also been uh, commended on uh, your views on gentrification. You know, w one thing that makes New York one of the greatest cities in the world is how many people are in it. It's a melting pot. Unfortunately, it looks like, you know, certain colors are melting out of that pot right now. Without a doubt. And being priced out of their neighborhoods. On Juneteenth, you, you gave a really impassioned speech where you said, in some ways, gentrification feels to you like a legacy of slavery. How, how do you fight gentrification? How do you create a world where people can move, can sell their places, but the city doesn't, doesn't create an environment where poor and love brown that. and black people are kicked out of their neighborhoods, essentially? I love that. I love that question, because people really uh, miss, when you start engaging in gentrification, people start to just close up mm -hmm. and start to get angry. Now we divide the lines. No. Uh, when you go back, uh, when I was a sergeant in the police department, a black woman moved into a place called Garrison Beach, and 
they tore up her house. They destroyed her house. I went out there with a group of 100 blacks in law enforcement, black police officers, and mm -hmm. said, we're going to sleep in this house, and we dare you to come and try to throw us out. Why do I say that? Because gentrification is not an ethnicity. It's a mindset. When you move into a community, and all of a sudden, you let your dog crap on somebody's yard and won't pick it up, and you ignore the people. You won't go into the stores that are there already, mm -hmm. and you want to arrest someone for playing dominoes, or, hey, somebody do double parks in front of this block, and we hear loud noises coming out. That's a church. And that church was there before you got there. So instead of treating communities as though you, they, they're not there, you didn't disco discover Brooklyn. You didn't discover Harlem. Come be a part of the communities and bring your flair, bring your character. That's how you merge together. On, on, a, on the ground, though, how do you make that happen? Because it, it's a complicated issue in that there are many homeowners in Harlem, in Brooklyn, et cetera, where I feel like they're, they're trapped in a, in a, in a loop that, the, where they're, they're destined to fail. There are people who own their homes. The homes aren't given the valuations that they deserve because they're black families living in a quote-unquote black neighborhood or because, you know, it's Latino families living in a quote-unquote Latino neighborhood and they, they don't get the valuations, they don't get the services. People say your home isn't worth much. Somebody comes in with a lot of money, they buy the place for pennies on the dollar. The more people do that, the more the values go up, the more the services go up, and now they've made a windfall on that. So how do you, how do you actually affect that on the ground beyond just saying to the people, don't move here and, 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 and you know, erase who's here? How, how do you help people with actual policy? Well, number one, we have to get back in the business of uh, home ownership. And we've moved away from that. We used to have something called Mitchell Lamas. We used to have, I brought my first home in Bedford Stuyvesant. Some people like to think I live in Jersey, but I live in Brooklyn. You know, I brought my first home in Best Stuy, and it was through a program, a federal program. It was, they had a program called Officer and Teacher Next Door Program because they felt as though if you brought uh, professionals into communities, you will help that mm. entire block. I started a block patrol, my first co op. I bought it in um, Prospect Heights. No one wanted to live there. When I got there, I started a, a patrol of the block. We started programs uh, with the people there. So black and brown communities, they want the same things. No matter uh, uh, a Latino community, mm -hmm, they want the mm -hmm. same things, with whatever community. What we have done in this city and in this country, we wait until communities are gentrified before we bring the services into the community. And I say no to that. You know, because you are the person that drives the limousine, you want the same thing as the person that sits in the back of the limousine, and you deserve the same thing, and that's what we have to do. Let's jump into two of some of those pressing issues in the city. Number one, uh, police, which touches on crime, but, it, you know, it's almost two separate issues at the same time. One of the things you ran on coming into office was, I'm going to bring down crime in New York City. Uh, since you've come into office, crime has skyrocketed. You know, it's only been five, six months, but I'm sure many people would love to know from your perspective, how long do you think that promise will take to achieve? And, and how do you actually bring crime down? Because every mayor has a different solution for actually achieving that. Well, it's, it's, it's a unique moment. You know, people that know my history, I was arrested at 15. I was beat badly by police officers. Uh, they assaulted my brother and I in the 103rd precinct. I returned back to that precinct when I became the mayor. Uh, I fought against stop Ill, the abuse of stop and frisk. I've testified in federal court. And the judge mentioned my testimony when she ruled against the police department. I can't go backwards. We can't go back to the days when every black and brown ch uh, child that walked the streets was treated unfairly. And so we have to have that balance. I like to say intervention and prevention. Intervention is right now. We took 3,000 guns off our street. Shootings dropped by 30 percent. Homicide dropped uh, by 13 uh, percent. We're moving in the right way, but I'm not going to allow us to be abusive in the process. Prevention, let's do the long-term things. Let's lean into foster care children so they have the opportunities and not mm -hmm. age out without the support. <laughs> let's do the dyslexia screening. Let's uh, go into how we educate our children, because if you don't educate, you will incarcerate. And we're feeding the criminal justice system, and no one cares. Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa mm -hmm. said, we spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in in the first place. We're pushing people into the river. And when you look downstream, you know who you're pulling out? You're pulling out the Eric Adams that are dyslexic. You're pulling out the foster care children. Black and brown children are falling in the river every day, and you have a mayor that has been in that river, and now I'm going upstream to prevent them from falling in the river.
you also have to balance that with how people feel in the city. You Definitely. Know? Yes. One of the hardest things about being a mayor, I, I can only assume, is that you, you, you're dealing with the reality and you're dealing with the feeling. Yes. You know, I remember yes. one of the first things that shocked me when I moved to New York was how much the local news terrifies you. Right. Every night they'd right. be like, watch out, someone's punching people in the street. <laughs> right. And it, it makes it seem like everything's right. happening everywhere. And yes, there are real crimes yes. being committed, but it's not as panicked as people make and, it and seem. I, and I'm loving that. Three, well, uh, last week we had about 3.5 million people that rode the train in a day. We have about six crimes on the subway per day. About six per day, those 3.5. Mm -hmm. So I have to deal with what you felt and then move to what you are feeling. And that takes some time before what, you're, what you felt and what you're feeling. With, so what does that look like? When we started out our homeless encampment on the subway system, my first month in office, I went and visited people that lived in camps and tents on the street. Mm -hmm. I saw human waste, drug paraphernalia. I said, people can't live like this. And so we did a program in our subway system. The first week, 22 people took us up on an offer to go into our shelter system. Right now, 1,700 are no longer living on the subway system and they're getting the services they deserve. But how do you, how do you, how do you um, deal with a situation where, you know, it's sensitive. And what I, what I don't like sometimes in America is people make it seem like these issues are easy. There's, right. there's no denying that in New York, the homeless issue cannot be separated from mental health issues. Without you know, a doubt. If you walk through the Without streets, you see it. Right. So how do you find a humane way to deal with people who, quote unquote, maybe want to live on the streets, but clearly cannot survive on the streets and then you're the mayor who's taking the people off the streets and saying, I think this is better for them. And they're saying, no, this, is, this isn't. How do you find that balance? Right. And so when I went into those tents in those cardboard boxes at, late at night uh, during the winter month, and I spoke to homeless, and I realized that, hey, this person is bipolar. There are people living on the street that can't make the decisions for themselves. And so everyone is advocating and saying they should have the decency to live on the street. There's nothing decent about that. And I'm a Christian. If Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was around right now, they'd be with me in the streets helping homeless people and not being removed or distanced from that. My programs are on the ground. I'm not afraid to be on the ground. I'm not afraid to make the mistake, man. I'm perfectly imperfect. You know, you know I'm, I'm doing my job mm -hmm. of turning around a city that has denied people for so long. I know that denial. I live there. I watched mommy work three jobs to take care of six children, and then they gave her food that caused her to have heart disease, diabetes. I was, I was diabetic. I woke up one morning, I couldn't see. The doctor said, everyone's going to be blind in a year. You're going to lose some fingers and toes. I went to see doctors that told me, it's your food. It's not your DNA. It's your dinner. When I changed my diet, within three weeks, my sight came back. My nerve damage went away. My body, I lost 35 pounds, 35 pounds. You look at, yeah. you look at, so, so, what you, so what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is you, you're trying to find the balance in a world where it's really difficult. Like, so do you have, do you have teams that are specifically tasked with helping homeless people who are struggling yes, with mental yes. health issues? Um, unbelievable combination. My team that I put together is extremely impressive. And we are on the ground talking to people and bringing them to a place where they ought to be. I can't meet people where I am. I have to go where they are and mm -hmm. take them where they ought to be. And you're going to look over this journey and people see the unorthodox way that I move. I don't fit the model. You know, this boy right, head right. cat with an earring, you know, <laughs> you know, he want to hang out at Zero Barn or at some other club. Listen, I'm New York. And New York has this energy and spirit to it. This is a unique place. It's not our Empire State Building. It's not the Statue of Liberty. We are who we are because as Apple soft drink owner said, we're made up of the best stuff on earth where New York is. <laughs> Let me ask you this then about New York. <laughs> this city has always, has always been an interesting place where the police unions and the mayors have often had a fraught relationship. You were a really unique mayor in that you were police, you come from police, and yet you've experienced police, and you've tried to change police, and, and, and yet at the same time, you go, you, you have to encourage the police. So obviously you have critics and fans right. that, that yeah. inhabit both spaces, right. but right. I'd, I'd love to know this, because I, I know a lot of New Yorkers have this as a question. When crime is down in the city, mayors will say, well, that means the police are doing their job, we need to give them more money, more funding to the police force, which oftentimes means less funding for the schools, the other services, et cetera, et cetera. But then when crime is up in the city, mayors will say, oh, that means we need to give the police more money because <laughs> they need more help bringing the crime down. So 
what, what I'd like to understand is why is it that in that job, whether things are going well or not going well, the money always increases. It doesn't seem like it matches what's happening in the city. And how do you address that as mayor whilst also acknowledging right, these are right, people, right. these are people in the city trying to keep everybody safe, et cetera, from right, a mayor's right, perspective, right, I understand it? Right. How, do you, how, do you, how do you find that balance? Good, good question. Well, first of all, the prerequisite to prosperity is public safety and justice. They go together. Historically, people will say, you could only have justice, you could only have public safety. And I say no to that. It's not a trade-off. We could have both. We could be safe and we could have justice justice, that accountability is going to be in place. But let's not kid ourselves. We have been producing an inferior product all across the city. You, we spend $38 billion a year on education. Yes, 65% of black and brown children never reach education. Mm -hmm. They've been playing us. <laughs> We've been getting played for so long. So the problem is not that people dislike me. They say, they, they, you know who dislike me? People have, who have been eaten off of us. All of those people who make contracts from pulling people downstream, you know how much money is made when the child is dyslexic and is not educated and he's incarcerated? You have counselors, you have therapists, you know, you have people who feed them prescription and drugs. People have been playing us, brother, for a long time. And now I come along and say, listen, the game, the gig is up. <laughs> you know? That's interesting. So, so do you, do you, have you found that you're getting a lot of resistance from people? Have you found that you've been getting a lot of resistance from people who feel like you, you're shaking things up a little too much? Because that's something any New Yorker knows, as, as, you know, especially if you're born here, but when you live here after a while, you realize everything feels like somebody's running something, whether it's the MTA or, you know, when you're driving across a bridge, you can feel power dynamics shift, et cetera. How do you then find that balance without being sabotaged then? Well, you, you, you have to be, first of all, you have to ignore the noise. We have 8.8 .8 million New Yorkers and 33 different opinions. There's only one mayor that's going to make the decisions. Right now, I'm the mayor, and I'm going to make the decisions for the next four years mm -hmm. to move this city in the right direction. So there's so much noise out there. And when you go after that institutional dollars that have been feeding and eating off this system, why do you think I'm under attack all the time? <laughs> why do you think they may write all these stories about Eric Adams? Because Eric Adams is going at the heart. Eric is taking the city upstream. And we're not spending all that money downstream. And that is, you, you are going, I'm, t I'm going after the foundation of people who have been eating off of the dysfunctionality of our communities for years. So, just in case I missed it, though, <laughs> I don't think I did, but how do you then grade whether the police are doing well or not in your city? Combination. Because it's not, you can't, we'll never be able to deal with this crime part problem with just police. Okay. You can't, we can't police our way out of this. When you have foster care children at age out at 21, mm -hmm. and you know every year 6,700 of them are, only 5% graduate from high school, only 22% graduate, I mean, 22% graduate from high school, 5% from college, they're more likely to be homeless, mental health, unemployed, victims of crime, participate in crime. So, what I'm saying, no, let's let, let's let them get support until they're 26, 90% graduate from high school. Let's open up our trade schools like I did at the Brooklyn Steam Center and give these children certifications. Let them go into some of these jobs. Google is here. Facebook is here. Mm -hmm. Why not have these children fed right into employment, be part of the growth of the city? So if you employ, then you won't have to worry about the criminality that you're seeing. By the time a child picks up a gun, we already failed. We failed already. So then, but then why do you care so much about some of the smaller things? You know, like, like for instance, why does the city need to spend so much money on police monitoring who jumps a fare and who doesn't? Like, what, what is the percentage of money I, that the city's I losing like on fare jumping? I like that. I like, like that. Like, do people That's really need to question. go to jail for, like, come on, it's... People are gonna pay. And the, and the people who don't pay, like, what is that percentage that's versus a, that's, everyone that's, else? That's, that's a great question. Here's what we, we can't do. We cannot send a message that any and everything goes in our city. Because it starts with, okay, so what someone jumps the fare. And when there are systems, we have a reduced fare metro card program. But if you can't pay enough, we're gonna give you the metro card. And there's ways to get on the system if you can't pay. So you can walk into Dwayne Reed and say, you know what, I'm gonna take whatever I want off the shelf and I'm going to walk out. Because now Dwayne Reed is gonna close down and that, that low wage employee who's going to school at night to try to make a living is gonna lose his job because mm -hmm. you decided you don't wanna pay. So we can't have a city where you can do whatever you want. No, we're gonna be a city we're not going to criminalize poor 
but we're not going to allow someone to state that their economic status is going to allow them to disrespect what it is to live in a city like New York. I know what it is to be poor, brother. We used to go to school every day with a garbage bag full of clothing because mommy said we're going to be thrown out and we want you to have clean clothing so you won't be embarrassed when you go to school. But mommy made sure we're going to always uplift ourselves, fight hard, and we're going to be respectful in the process. I'm not going to allow people to believe because of where they are is who they are. We're so much better. So let's talk about one of the parts of the city that everyone agrees needs to become better, and that is affordability. Yes. As you said, New York City is not made by the Empire State Building. It's not made by the Statue of Liberty. It's made by the people. Yes. The people feel like they can't remain in New York because they can't afford to live here. And you're seeing this spread. It's going out to Brooklyn, it's spreading into Harlem, many parts. I mean, the main part of the island is almost unaffordable for most people. For people who don't live in rent-controlled apartments, where, they, where there's no recourse. I've heard people's rents jump by 20%, 30%, 40%. It, it can just do whatever, and you're out. Mm -hmm. Your life has changed. It becomes unaffordable. Half the places in Midtown are owned by people who don't even live in the city, never mind the country. What do you do as mayor to, pr to prevent that from happening? How do you make it so that the people actually want to live in the city? Because I've seen you say, by the way, people need to come back to the office. I've yes. seen you say, yes. we need to get back in the office. People need to get, you know, the New York City Have back to. to life. And I understand why. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can also see why people say, well, Mayor Adams, why should I come back to the city when I can go and live you know, 40 minutes away, 50 minutes away in Connecticut on a train and not have to pay these rents anymore. How do you prevent these people from turning this into a ghost town? Yeah, very, very, it's, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, charity begins at home. I have a small three, uh, a three family uh, house. My tenants, when they moved in uh, several years ago, 15, 16 years ago, I had them sign a lease that as long as you live in my uh, apartments, you'll never have your rent increased at all. And they've been there and they've never had a rent increase. Never? Never, never. Wow. From the time that they moved in, they, they, the, the, the audience is saying, where do you live so I can move in? You know? <laughs> but because there's so much for human need, there's just not a lot for human greed. Gandhi said that. Yeah, but how do you, what do you do? And so what, do you what do? I must do yeah. as the mayor is now create affordable housing, which we're doing, uh -huh. and which is very interesting, you have some of the people who are advocating for affordable housing, and I say, okay, great. We're gonna build it on your block. Whoa, whoa wait, not on my block. Right, right. <laughs> you, know, you know, you wanna right. upzone on my block? Yes. See, we have to stop the hypocrisy of people, those who are advocating for something, but when it's time to produce it in their space, yes. to inconvenience them, yes. now they have a whole nother conversation. We wanna build safe haven beds. Show me the community that's gonna allow me to build a safe haven, bed, haven beds to give wraparound services. So we must get in the business of affordable housing, mm -hmm. but once we build it, we have to put people in the units. We've had almost 2,200 units that were empty because we didn't have a system in place that is the dysfunctionality of we were just counting how many units we have. But hey, how many people that you put in those units? Right. We're moving in another direction. Then we do a NYCHA. We got NYCHA Land Trust. Every tr everybody tried to do what we're doing now with NYCHA Land Trust. Almost 400,000 people that were living in substandard conditions. Now we have a land trust where they're going to be able to pick the contractors. They're going to have a voice in picking the contractors. They're going to have a voice in voting on the land trust. Mm -hmm. We're going to change the game of NYCHA, which you know what NYCHA residents have been going through for years. And now we're moving in another direction. So, so the affordability so is crucial. Make you, it affordable. Do you, do you think you can find the balance? Because as a mayor, you're always responding to business, some of the richest people in the city. Yes. You know, you, you, you're responding to the people who are annoyed by poor people, as you yes. said, the, the NIMBYs, not in my mm. backyard, right. right? They want right. change, but not in their backyard. And you're responding to the majority of the 8 million people. Yes. What do you think you're going to be able to do in the, in the short term? I understand the ideas behind it, but what, what's a concrete thing you can say to New Yorkers where you go like, hey, this is what I'm actually going to do right, for right, you in the right, short term? Right, and we're doing that right now. First of all, the affluent New Yorkers. Do you know 52% of our taxes are paid by 2% of New Yorkers? I can believe that. If we lose those 2%, we lose our teachers, our firefighters, our cops. So for me not to engage those high-income earners, uh -huh. That's, that's a foolish as a mayor, and I'm not going to do that. I want them to pay their taxes. I want them to uh, volunteer. I want them to contribute to my museums, to my nonprofits. They need to be a part of that. And so when you look at what we're doing right, right away, childcare vouchers, 
um, for uh, families in the city. Mm -hmm. You know, people were paying $50 a week. We were able to get them down to $10 a week. We're hoping so many new seats uh, in, in child care. What we're doing with dyslexia screening, what we're doing with college fund for our children. When you, when you start out a college fund for a child, they're four times more likely to uh, go to college by having that uh, child care, child, I mean, this college fund. Right. Um, when, you, when you look at what we're doing, what's called the crisis management team, and how they deal with crisis on the ground uh, for pre prevention, mm -hmm. of what we're doing with earned income tax credit. Brother, we send back billions of dollars because people don't know how to fill out the forms to get the resources that they deserve. So we're making it that easier and streamlining uh, the uh, earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. So we're doing things that are going to put money back in the pack pockets of New Yorkers. Then we're going to empower them on how job readiness, how to be part of the city as it builds up. Cities that are built up and futures of people going down is unacceptable in this administration. And you're going to see visible results in this city. So before I let you go, I'd yes. love to know real quick, what would you grade yourself as, as a mayor right now? What, what grade would you give yourself? And, <laughs> and I know it's a tough one. I, know, you, no, you, no, you no, know, I told you when we spoke earlier, there's no tough questions for me because okay, I'm okay. authentic. All right. I'm going to be me. You are you, definitely. I'll say that about you. What would you grade yourself as as a mayor? <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I'm incomplete. I'm incomplete. Oh, I'm oh incomplete. interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting yeah, one. I'm incomplete. All right. I'm, 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 I'm incomplete as a mayor. I'm incomplete as a man. I'm incomplete as a father. Uh -huh. I'm incomplete complete in my personal life. I get up every morning. I meditate. I exercise. Uh, I pray. I, I say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I get myself ready. Every day? Every day. <laughs> Every day. I mean, that, the last one's a bit weird, Every you have day. to admit. Well, but it's not. It's not when you think. I mean, surely the flag knows by now that you, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, well, you know, we, you know, this country, <laughs> this, 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 this country has a lot of issues. Yes, it does. But I've been all over the globe. And this is the only country where dream is attached to our name. That's not a German dream, a French dream. Well, the French dream is, but it's a very different right. kind of dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's talk about you as a human being for a yes. moment. Something that has really intrigued people about you is who you are, as you say. You yes. know, the earring wearing, you know, vegetarian but fish eating, um, <laughs> late night going out. I mean, we've seen pictures of you with rappers, with models, you know, partying, <laughs> having a good time, still getting out. You don't seem afraid to be who you are and do what you're doing and not have that um, negatively impact the idea of your job as a mayor. Are you worried at all about image, or do you think it's all just got to be about what you actually do on the ground? Listen, listen, uh, I've, I'm, a, I'm a real believer uh, that I believe in quantum physics. I believe you create your reality. Uh, I, I, I put in the universe almost 30 years ago that in 2022, I was going to be mayor. And every place I, I traveled to, I told people I'm going to be mayor. People look back over the records and me speaking back when I was a captain, when I was a state senator, uh, when I was a borough president, they heard me say, I'm going to be mayor in 2022. People don't reach their reality because they don't believe in the power of what they say. And so the universe knows I'm contributing to the universe. The universe is going to make sure that I'm all right. I'm going to be all right. How people judge me, that's up to them. Uh, I like Eric. And uh, I had a, an amazing, <laughs> amazing mother that told me when I, when I went on the stage to speak as a child and I was nervous, mommy leaned over and whispered in my ear, baby, you got this. And she transitioned last year. But every time I'm out here, I still hear mommy whisper in my ear, baby, you got this. Oh. And I'm saying to New Yorkers, we got this, New York. Don't even worry about it. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate the time. I know you're a busy man. I hope to have you back. We'll talk about this every few years.